Thanks to Acast for hosting and monetizing the podcast. Oh, hello there. Nice to see you. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby! And I am that woman, your host, Liv. Here today with part two of my conversation with the oh-so-fun and knowledgeable Eduardo Garcia Molina. This was such a fun conversation. It was amazing just letting Eduardo talk about all of this. So much information just sitting in his brain waiting for a microphone. It's awesome. The Hellenistic period has never really interested me all that much because I've been so focused on the archaic and classical, but now? Man, am I fascinated by these Hellenistic kings and their varied empires, the way they expanded and melded with local cultures, combined gods and traditions. It's all so fascinating. Turns out so much can happen over many hundreds of years. Like, who knew? A period of culture shock, the middle child, so many interesting ways of viewing and and understanding this period. Like, Fuck, I love learning new things about the ancient world. Discovering periods and ideas that I didn't know would be as interesting and appealing as they are. (sighs) There's so much more than Alexander and Cleopatra to the Hellenistic period. So many hundreds of years in between. So much happening. So much to add to our understanding of the ancient world and the people who lived there. Just all across the Mediterranean and beyond. (sighs) Man. But again, why am I trying to explain about it when I could just play the rest of our episode? Conversations, Hellenistic kings, mythic callbacks, and cosplaying heroes. The Hellenistic Period with Eduardo Garcia Molina. Because I did, I did the basic Greek history in university, and I know that there was like two courses that were required under the program, and it was like pre-Alexander and post. Yeah, and I, I hate that so much. Yeah, it's like that's it. And then also, though, the Greek history prof when I was at Concordia was like the world's oldest man. Like he should have <laughs> retired so long before, and you could tell in every moment that he was speaking. And it's just unfortunate because I think I had a great prof for Roman history. And it's so much more memorable, even though the Greeks are like my people, but mm. it's just like the, the way it's taught. But, yeah, a lot, a lot yeah. of it has to do with teaching. Uh, and a lot of the times, especially for Hellenistic history, because maybe a department doesn't have someone that focuses on that, mm-hmm. you, you'll you'll get someone, you'll get like a Roman, uh, an early uh, empire scholar that has to do like a gen ed course. And they, of course, want to just like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, get to that. So the, the, the period also suffers from in gen ed courses being seen as kind of a stepping stone and, all, and people just also focus on the West. Uh, mm. Because, of course, the Hellenistic period is not only a tale of, of the Hellenistic empires, but also the rise of Rome. Mm-hmm. And it's such a gravity well of interest there because you have so much extant history that focuses on that from antiquity. Polybius is one of our main sources, like writing a history, um, because we don't have, so many authors are lost to us. Uh, There's a Babylonian author that writes a history of the Babylonian period up to like, I know, but he's lost. Uh, I know. The more I, I mean, that this is a constant, obvious, like, thing in my life, but it's like I always, I'm, there's always a new one to learn about and be like horribly yeah. distraught that we don't yeah. have things. Uh, what I would do for Barossos is Babyloniaca. You see snippets of it in like later Greco-Roman authors mm. because they have it, of course. They, they can reference yeah. it. So it, we, we can see snippets of it. But it would be so nice to have. But that's one of the things, studying the, studying the Hellenistic period is also a, a study of frustration. Uh, mm-hmm. Because our literary sources are scant, 
And if they are, they're typically looking westward because they're typically Greco-Roman authors. You have mainly it's Polybius for the histories. And then you have a bunch of inscriptions that supplanted. Um, you have like Appian and, and uh, other authors later on, your Plutarchs and everything. But they focus a lot on Polybius, especially. He, he states in the beginning of his history, he wants to focus on why the heck these weirdos in, in Italy have suddenly become a superpower uh, in the Mediterranean. He says that, well, not weirdo. Uh, weirdos is kind of implied in his wording. Um, <laughs> I like it. I mean, if, you, if you're, a, if you're a, um, a captive of Rome and you're, <laughs> you're uh, writing in the Scipionic circle, uh, you try to massage it a little bit. One of my favorites, actually, uh, stories, uh, I forget what author this is, but the Romans are still consolidating in Italy, right? Uh, this is in the third century. See, third century. They're talking with the people of Tarentum, which is a little town in, what's that part of the boot? Like the heel. Hmm. Yeah, in the heel of the Italian peninsula. And the Roman delegates are trying to speak Greek because it's a Greek town. The Greeks colonized that in Southern Italy, uh, profusely, mm -hmm. it's what's called Magna Graecia. And the Roman delegates, they're negotiating like rights to sail their ships uh, near their sea. And they're trying to speak to this the town to the representative of the town in Greek, but they fumble their words. Their Greek is not good. Their pronunciation is bad. So as they're departing the city, the negotiations break down. As they're departing the city, one of the uh, there's a story that a, a certain town drunk, I forget his name off the top of my head. Um, he walks over to these weirdos in their togas, and he poops on the, t <laughs> the Roman delegate's toga. And I forget what the comeback is, but the, the, the Roman delegate just basically goes, you're going to regret this. And they do, um, <laughs> because then later uh, the Romans take over. The uh, Tarentum actually invites Pyrrhus of Epirus over. So this is the so this is in the 270s. They invite Pyrrhus over to save them from Roman encroachment. Um, mm. So this is where you get like Romans first encountering elephants. Uh, you have a Hellenistic king attacking the Romans for the first time. Yeah, Italy is just a, a, a the Roman Republic especially is is a, a well that it draws a lot of interest toward. But they don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, mm -hmm. Even in the second century, when they're expanding, they're still like interacting uh, with these empires that still are a threat. Even after 188, the Seleucid Empire is still considered a threat. And Tychus the Fourth has a military buildup. He has a military parade an impressive one, 20 years after that treaty, uh, where the Romans say you're not allowed to have elephants and stuff. He has elephants and he parades them around. There's a Roman treaty that says you're not allowed to have elephants? Yeah, because elephants are like, you know, in battle, they're scary. Um, I mean, no, that makes sense, but I just love that there's a treaty that's like, no elephants. That's yeah, the new rule. You, yeah. One of the stipulations is, yeah, you can't have elephants. Because it's like, they're basically tanks. Yeah, an um, unfair advantage. <laughs> yeah, ex ex exactly. So one of them is, yeah, one of the two. And they're also a sign of imperial power. They're a mm -hmm. sign of royal power because... I mean, they're badass. Fucking yeah, elephants. exactly. Uh, they, they, oh, dang it. I forgot off the top of my head. Antiochus, one of the Antiochus had a... I think one of the Seleucid kings had an elephant named Patroclus. Oh. And yeah, he was his favorite too. Um, and he got like a silver cage or something because he was the only one that, I might be butchering this story, but I'm pretty sure the elephant was called Patroclus and he was given a like pimped out like carriage, the, the, I forget what it's called, the thing on the back of the elephant, he yeah. gets a pimped out one because he's, he was the only elephant that crossed the bridge and while the other elephants were too scared to or something <gasps> like that. So he got a sweet, I'm pretty sure it was Patroclus. That's um, precious. I mean, it's a right. precious story regardless, but I'll take that it's Patroclus. So. Yeah. Elephants are just like the, this. They, you, you have the Bactrian kings who have, I am fascinated by headgear because mm. headgear says a lot about like what you try, uh, what you're trying to be. And the mm. Bactrian kings on these coins have a wonderful like elephant head on, on them, like a elephant hat. That's the skin of an elephant. And it's so oh. like sweet on the, they have the tusks and everything um, oh. because elephants project this like power. Conversely, yeah. to go back to the myths, Philip the second, or sorry, Philip the fifth. Oh my God. Uh, uh, the famous Antigonan monarch who fought against the Romans and lost. There's a coin of his early on in his reign where he actually has Perseus cosplay 
like he has a winged hat on one of his coins and he's trying to be Perseus. He's embodying oh Perseus because that's how he legitimizes. He wants to point back because Perseus is tied with the Argive lineage uh, yeah. at Argos. So he's calling back. So you have these like mythic callbacks that these Hellenistic kings are doing all the time. Yeah. Um, so Lucas has Apollo. I don't know if you're familiar with the Seleucus myth. So this is great. And these myths have a, have a hold because we know a lot of them. For example, a lot of the Seleucus myths and the myths around like Antioch, we know from a guy called Ioannis Malalas. Malalas? Yes. I always, I always, so I think I always, add, I always add an extra la. But he's writing, in, he's writing in the sixth century CE and they still like can recall these like local myths about mm. their king. So one of them is that Seleucus the first, the founder of the Seleucid dynasty, his mom was visited by Apollo and they had sex. So actually Seleucus is the son of Apollo and he has a birthmark in his inner thigh in the shape of an anchor. So that's one of the myths. And then his mom gives him a ring that Apollo gave to her to give to her son to sit like, with this ring, you shall conquer. And he eventually conquered the East. So they build on these like mythic lineages. The Seleucid yeah. coins very early on, you see Apollo on them. He, he's naked. He's sitting on an omphalos and he's like checking a bow. He's like inspecting a bow. And one of the cool things is that if you look at the Achaemenid coins right before the Seleucids, they have the, uh, the, the Achaemenid king sitting on a chair with a bow. And it looks almost like Apollo later on sitting on an omphalos inspecting the bow. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at like how local people that lived under the Achaemenids that have history knowing the Achaemenids before the Seleucids, how they looked at this coin that looked super similar to an Achaemenid king, like an actual Achaemenid king sitting there, but now you have Apollo. Like, do they think that's Seleucus? Yeah. And if so, you have the boundary between moral and divine being super blurred, even more so. So it's stuff like that. Like, Seleucus also wrestled a bull. Uh, I forget where they were, but he was just chilling with a bunch of, you know, Alexander's uh, posse and a bull rampaged and almost gored Alexander and Seleucus being Seleucus grabbed the bull by the horns and stopped it. And then in the second century, you have people dedicating to a, a king whose lineage goes back to Seleucus. They give him a bull statue. Mm. Like, so like these myths aren't just stories. They, they, they exist in the physical world. People put a lot of emphasis on them. And it's not only the Greeks, because other people are there. Most, <laughs> most are not Greeks. Mm -hmm. um, but you see them interacting. They bring their own things. The Greeks bring their own. And you have this like hodgepodge, this wonderfully complex hodgepodge, which I think is why the Hellenistic period doesn't get enough cred. Because it's lumped into this, oh, the Greeks just come in. Greek culture, the superior culture, is brought in. It enlightens everyone. And then you have the Romans, and then they bring their own stuff, yada, yada. But it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. No, people coexist. It, it, people interact with it. The Greeks are just as recipient to local myths as indigenous people are recipient to Greek myths. Mm -hmm. There's not an imbalance of that. Uh, that's, yeah. not, that's just not how people work, but that's how histories are written. Yeah. Because histories gamify everything. They want, ah, these people come in. It has to be yada, yada, mono everything so i'm curious this uh the work i'm thinking of is definitely not hellenistic it's later but i feel like it is such an emblematic piece i guess of of the hellenistic period so i'm curious mm -hmm. if you have any thoughts on on the dionysiaca knownness i mean it's just like a wild epic like the longest greek epic i think we have but i think it's from fourth century ce so but that's where we get i think most of the content on Dionysus and his like Indian campaign and Dionysus right. and all of that. I see it as the product of the Hellenistic period. Mm. <laughs> because like we talked about with Barossos, this this Babylonian chronicler, um, there in Catesius with the Persiaca. Uh, um, he, sure. he wrote the Persica and the uh, Indica. 
which is uh, the Persica history uh, of the regions in Assyria and in Babylon, and the Indica, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a kind of, it's not like Pausanias with, with mm. Greek, but it, it talks about India. Um, so yeah, because Dionysus features so prominently um, in, in this conversation about the East and about India, and you have all these authors that we no longer have that uh, contributed so much to the Greco-Roman imaginary mm. of what is going on in that region that it's just a, a, a natural product. But of course, I would say that uh, because I play Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon uh, with the Hellenistic period. But, it, it, but it's true because, again, like we talked about in the beginning, periodization is moot. Things do not stop, uh, and and things. Of course, the the Greeks knew about the East before the Hellenistic period, but there's just so much more interaction on the ground, so and, much more opportunity for that. Yeah, and they'd gone further by then, though, too, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because were they familiar with India before Alexander, or like, I mean, maybe I would say yes, that. because the yeah. Achaemenids were so through the Achaemenids uh, for sure, but not to the to the degree because it really opens up you have heck you even have inscriptions from like relatively close to india you have bilingual inscriptions in greek uh oh, and cool. and local in yeah and so there's so much interaction going on um, you have the indo-greek kingdoms after bactria kind of falls in the and the second century bactria? bactria is in afghanistan uh um mm -hmm. Yeah, as much as, yeah, you know, as you know ancient states country. to, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but in, in around those areas, in Central Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's wonderful scholarship, super recent scholarship being done on that, because that area is just yielding so much new information, so much in the way of in bilingual inscriptions, coins with, with local script, where you have a very Hellenized king for these Indo-Greek kingdoms that pop up after Bactria falls in the second century BCE. And you have local script alongside Hellenistic, like Hellenistic imagery, like kings on horseback with the diadems and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But you have local script. And also you have temples. The temple architecture is a biggie because they don't conform to traditional Hel uh, Hellenistic style temples you see that they had the, the famous one is the one at Icanum. it's called the temple with indented niches um, mm. that shows local adaptation local syncretism with like pre-hellenistic local architecture but then you have a smattering of like your your greek temple architecture and you see these all over the place yeah. well not all over the place but certainly you see them pop up mm -hmm. uh these temples that appeal to different value sets. They're not just spreaders of Hellenic cultures as some museums uh, in Greece, much to my uh, <laughs> dismay. Oh my God, I saw some, some, some little labels that just very, very adamant about spreading. And it, it spread, yes, but the wording on it is implying that like, you know, it's, it's some sort of manifest destiny or something. I've been doing a lot of like soul searching as to why the heck I'm I'm drawn to this period. Mm. I think a lot of it, especially because like I focus on how subjects communicate with statal power uh, in the Seleucid Empire specifically, and I think that's a lot, has a lot to do with how Puerto Rico is because I was born there. How Puerto Rico manages under the power of the United States, and how you have how you negotiate how people we in puerto rico you use the u.s dollar bill in in the seleucid empire if you were under them you would use uh minted coinage bearing their insignia bearing their presidents their their uh, kings mm -hmm. uh, so it's stuff like that how do smaller powers negotiate their position with a, with a greater imperial power and just like puerto rico you coincide you people continue living you still have local traditions but you see meshes with the power that's dominating the area that's why you have like super spanglish uh uh mm -hmm. and stuff like that you see that in the language you see that in coins and in, in the seleucid empire you see the phoenician cities with punic alongside the greek you see them trying to translate their local offices 
into Greek words that make sense when they put on these inscriptions. Like in the Diotimos inscription, they're trying to, one of the things is how do we translate this local magistrate? And they come up with a Greek word. It probably is not a one-to-one, -one, but A. It's so, it's so interesting and it connects with like a lot of what I've talked about recently on the podcast, which is just kind of like, obviously I specialize or like I focus on Greek because that's what I know, but I also mm -hmm. am like making a conscious effort to make sure that all my listeners who are typically not academics, who are just like nerds who want to learn about Greek myth right. and just make sure that people understand that our, the general broad modern and specifically like quote unquote Western understanding of, of the Greek world is deeply biased and, you know, yeah. and makes Greece sound like this be all and end all of intelligence and culture. Yeah. And yeah. And then like you're saying how, like, you know, the idea of they just spread Hel Hel Hellenistic culture, yeah. and, you know, took over and all this and, and that's nonsense. And, you know, and they, even in the classical period and and archaic too they were you know interacting with other people and you know the mediterranean is a large place and greece did yeah. not exist in a vacuum and they had their own understandings of everyone else their own opinions yeah. good and bad yeah it's just it's so fascinating to look at that like like i said i've recently looked at the general mythological understanding of africa and just the way that mm -hmm. i i was interested to I mean, and obviously this is, it's very Greek, but it, it seems to me somewhat specific to Africa or sort more, to, more widespread there, I guess, where they seem to have like really made an emphasis on Hellenizing, I guess, a lot of the things there of like, you know, the rivers had their Hellenic nymphs associated with them. And then they, yeah. those nymphs had the names, you know, that we know, like there's a Nile, Nileus, and there's mm -hmm. Memphis. They basically like under like you know interact with the Egyptians and beyond you know who they called the Ethiop Ethiopians what they called mm -hmm. Libya generally and then developed like Greek stories to coincide yeah and it almost makes me think that they wanted to like see them as less barbarian I guess than than they saw a lot of other places because they really made an effort to be like no they've got a lot of Hellenic background or you know and even the way that they made mm -hmm. Io the founder of Egypt. And also the founder of a lot of Greece, you right. know, and they were like, no, no, we see the Egyptians. They're pretty cool. They've got those pyramids. <laughs> like, let's make them Greek somehow in our mythology. And I just find that so interesting. Yeah, there's just a, there's a big thing with mythic geography mm -hmm. and, and the delineation of Greek space uh, and the rationalization of local terrain like, for example, terrain in Syria or something like that, how to mesh that with the Greek mythic imaginary. And you have some really good examples, like um, uh, going back to the, the Seleucus myths, one of them is he wanted to found a city, as all Hellenistic uh, monarchs do. They really love founding cities. Particularly in their mythology, too, so it connects sí. all well. <laughs> yeah. Exactamente. And this is in Antioch, on the Orontes, uh, so northern Syria near the coast, near a, a city called Seleucia Pieria that I recently did an article for. And you have this mountain called Mount Cassios. Big old mountain. Uh, okay, you go, big old mountain, sky god, Zeus. There's a myth that Seleucus was sacrificing on the mountain to see where he would found a city. And the myth goes that an eagle comes in, as they oft do, and grabs the sacrifice and plops it down where Seleucia Pieria is. And you're like, okay. And there's a, a cult to Zeus. Uh, you see this in the coins. They have a thunderbolt on a really plush cushion, actually. It's like a really comfy cushion, not this <laughs> the royal cushion. It's very uh, nice on the coins. Pero new research has stressed that before there was this foundation, there was already probably a cult to a local sky deity. And these people did not just leave uh, when, uh, you know, Seleucia Pieria. No, they probably went to the city. They were given land or they went into the city or they settled nearby, maybe some redistribution or something. But they probably worshipped. They kept on worshipping whatever deity they worshipped before. And it coincided with this, the, this new, like, Hellenic identity. But you have these coins and they're super proud of it. And it's more than likely that people saw the Thunderbolt and they thought different deities. Mm -hmm. We, of course, 
because we we have a lens uh, depending on your your. This is one of the things and uh, another reason the the Hellenistic period suffers um, in terms of scholarship. Not anymore, thankfully. But it was draw. It, it it was a casualty of that divide that you see in classics, where they don't want to acknowledge anything else in the Mediterranean mm. that is going on that is not Greek and Rome. And the Hellenistic period suffered because of this for a very long time. Now, thankfully, for example, I have my wonderful colleagues uh, uh, working at the uh, Near Eastern uh, Department uh, and the the Oriental Institute here at UChicago. It's one of the big draws why I went here is because you can learn so much from these archaeologists, these historians, heck, these philologists that focus on Near Eastern things and contextualize a lot of the stuff that happens in these empires that has been kind of steamrolled through the predominance in classics and in, in ancient history as, as a, another field uh, in line with this for, um, oh, Athena is meowing in the background. Um, yeah, but the, this emphasis on Greeks and the Romans, uh, that really tinges the conversation in a negative way uh, because it, it, it erases a lot of people's lived existences and, and how they saw themselves working within this new environment. They survived, like, they survived. They rationalized their own things. Myths continue, like, people believe, kept their local beliefs. You can have people coinciding with different beliefs. Uh, I know that is harder to say nowadays where everything is becoming so, uh, uh, como que se dice, divisive. And, and that's not to say that there, there might not have been instances of violence. That's not to, again, this is not a hand-holding there is still problems. There is still the the state still has arms. There is revolt, especially in Egypt. There's a, mm. a lot of indigenous revolts, but still, people people continue to to survive and and hold on to their beliefs. Beliefs change. They adapt to new things. You rationalize them. It's not just oh, you see Apollo on a coin. I now worship I Apollo. I worship Apollo. Yeah. Exactamente. Apollo. Exactamente. Yeah, and, and 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 current research is is shedding light on this. It's, uh, uh, it's one of the the wonderful things about studying it now is that you have so many options for, and even heck, even general books are now popping up that that seek to ameliorate this problem of a, a heavily Western Greek and Roman bias, um, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's so dynamic and so fun. Stephanie Langenhooper, a wonderful scholar, she just recently released a book on miniatures, like miniature figurines that, hmm. that children play with in Hellenistic Babylonia. Yeah. And, cool. and you see, yeah, exactly. And you see like references to Greek goddesses alongside local divinities, mirabile dictu. Uh, these two things can happen. People can see different things in different objects mm -hmm. or in the same object, excuse me. Yeah, I think that's why it's so it's so fulfilling to study this because it, you can still have you can still be interested in like Greek mythology and you can approach it through that lens, but you can see how people respond to it if you want. Just like if if you're someone that does like a Near Eastern scholarship, you can totally look at it from the other side. That's one of the mm -hmm. good things about Hellenistic history is that. More and more scholars are incorporating dialogues that are occurring in fields like Near Eastern history, uh, archaeology, everything like that. A lot of it is driven, again, because we don't have much sources, much <laughs> literary sources. Yeah. And, and, and somewhat thank God for that, or else we wouldn't be so heavily invested in all of this. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, there's more. It, it, it's, it's a really, um, yeah, it's not just Alexander and Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much stuff in between, so much weird stuff. The satanic panic in Rome with Bacchus. Ooh, do tell. Wait, so there's this super, I'm sure some Roman historian will chide me for calling it the satanic panic, but it's I, so I, fun. There's, there's there's an inscription called the Senatus uh, Consultum de Bacchanalibus, the, the decision of the Senate, uh, the Senate concerning the Bacchanals, the worshippers mm. of Bacchus. Mm -hmm. And this is in... 186 BCE, it's published. Um, and it's these these conservative Romans, like you think of your Cato the Elders or something, your, your hardcore, conservative, traditional Roman value Romans panicking 
because these Greek cults are coming in and people are worshiping Bacchus and they're having these rites at night and we don't know what's happening. They might like be plotting to, to overthrow the state. Pentheus at all. Yeah, it's like the <laughs> fire festival, but like a political <laughs> fire festival. Um, and and so you have this like freak out moment in 186 and it, it's 186. So it's like Rome is still dipping its toes into the, the world of the Hellenistic East. Um, mm. So you have this like backlash where you have this, this consultant, this decision of the Senate that goes like, hey, you can't meet at night. Parties can be no larger than so-and-so. Like they're super worried about this, this new cult. And a lot of it is tied, this is one of the things that I focus on too, on perceptions of the East as corrupting, as wealthy, and as sexually deviant. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Uh, they're seen as passive, soft things. They're, they're, subser they're sub, they're subservient because they, they're under kings. So they naturally must. There's a lot of like geographical thinking also that the heat is what causes them to to be soft and compliant. <laughs> see, pero yes, but you see like 19th century histories latching onto this uh, this notion, like this Greco-Roman notion of the East. This is especially clear when you talk about like the Roman emperors. The ones that come from the East, they generally get a bad rap. Uh, they get dragged through the muck. In, in uh, ancient sources, they get called like, like feminine, uh, uh, yeah, sexually transgressive, or, and, and other things. And it does have this association with, just like they see the Germans as a bunch of, uh, the Romans see the Germans as a bunch of weirdos with uh, big beards that like, keep to themselves that don't interbreed with other tribes or something like that. So they keep their fighting prowess and that gets taken to dangerous levels later on when you have 19th century German scholars looking at this and going, ah, racial purity is what oh, made, uh-huh. There's a, yeah. a wonderful book by, it's called, it's called A Most Dangerous Book. And it deals with Tacitus's Germania and how Tacitus, this Roman author talks about Germany and talks about like these weirdo Germans who keep to themselves and keep their race pure and that's why they're strong. And then 19th century German authors hot off the heels of like German nationalism, you know, this is the time when German unification happens. They're looking for past history. They're looking for something in antiquity to, to make a German people unite under this new mm -hmm. nation state. And they look towards that. And that's when stuff starts getting real dangerous. But the yeah. East has a similar thing. Uh, the barbarians in the in the north they're hardy weirdos they're hairy they put um butter in their hair to make it shine i don't know if you've seen 90 day fiance but that always <laughs> makes me think of big ed with the mayonnaise in his hair it's so gross um and, I... but the east is a similar thing where where you have the and you can still see it somewhat like they're corrupt they're exotic they have all this money and wealth and that naturally leads to like they're fat or or they're they're uh they take on multiple partners they let themselves be penetrated <gasps> they, they hoard all this money and you see this in like hellenistic ptolemaic kings they get depicted like this all the yeah. time um all i can think of is 300 I feel sí, like exactamente. 300, yeah, is like a perfect sí. example of all of that. Sí, exactamente. It, it, heck, if they did a 300, uh, well, they wouldn't do it. But there's a there's a battle of Thermopylae, Antiochus the third versus the Romans. Hmm. Uh, right? Uh, it, 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 it is, it's not 197. It's in the 190s. Uh, forgive me, I forget off the top of my head. Did it happen at Thermopylae? Yeah. Oh, like right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but if you read the accounts of it, Antiochus kind of puts himself in the position of the, the Hellenic, like the Greeks, mm -hmm. and the Romans are kind of portrayed as the weirdos that are invading. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of like a duality. But that also mm -hmm. happens. Um, there's a very famous invasion of Gauls that occurs in Greece, right, in the, the 270s. This is like a, a moment 
in, in time, you have this Gallic invasion that goes all the way to Delphi. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. There's a battle at Thermopylae. There's an, a, a league of, of Greeks that uh, try to stop them at Thermopylae. They're successful somewhat, but then there's some forces that reach Delphi. Um, this is in 279 and 8. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another little branch that goes into Asia Minor. And they eventually become the Galatians uh, mm -hmm. that dwell in Central uh, Asia Minor. And the fun thing is that these Galatians later get beat up by an Adelid king. So the Adelids are the ones that are in Pergamon. Um, and then you have the... Um, the Altar of Pergamon, the famous Altar of Pergamon, right? Under Eumenes II in the 2nd century BCE that gets constructed. And you have this battle against the Galatians in like the 240s, I believe. And it gets recast as the Gigantomachy. Hmm. So, yeah, so the Pergamene king, um, which I believe is Attalus I at this point, it's not Philatiros. Uh, Attalus I defeats the Galatians, right? And the Adelids are set up as the Olympian gods, and the mm. Gauls are set up as the giants. There's a lot of cosmology also that gets tied into Hellenistic kingship. Yeah, like Antiochus IV has that parade that I mentioned a while ago. He has a wonderful parade at Daphne, and it's kind of like a, a celestial cosmology. He has a lot of different gods that show up, and day and night are represented, and he's at the head of it in this incredibly lush procession. And there's a lot of like, symbolism for like Hellenistic kings being the the cosmos they're the order bringers they're the ones that um you need a lot of it is tied to yeah notions of Greek mythology but also near eastern mythology because the the empires that came before that of course use similar things they were the order the Assyrians uh, uh and the Achaemenids that were the order and everything outside the empire was chaos hmm. so a similar line of thinking so everybody in that parade could like, get a grasp of what was going on. You did not need to be up on your, like, Greek mythology to yeah. figure out what the heck is going on. Yeah, it's just one of those things that's lost, oh. uh, I guess, in, in translation and in, in, in superficial uh, superficial readings. And, and But we love our clean and nice histories. The problem is that history doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is why every, every academic gets called a spoil sport or something. I don't like Alexander. Oh, no. I must want to cancel him. No, I just want people to realize that he is a privileged uh, son of a king who got one heck of a great army behind him. Of course, he was a great general also. I'm not, but still, he did some bad stuff. Uh, uh, <laughs> as the people of Tyre, 30,000 roughly people got sold into slavery. Like, wow. we have to keep, th yeah, we have to keep things balanced. We can't fall back to this, like, hero worship and you see this with like your bezos and your your uh musks where they like and and what's his face uh the metaverse guy uh oh zuckerberg see they see themselves as like augustus or or and, and, and there are interviews that they yeah i mean and alexander zuckerberg have a classics degree see we don't talk about him uh <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things I could say, but Bezos especially, I, uh, I believe he's the one that like called Alexander forward. <laughs>
were super fascinated by by Hellenistic art uh, and Greek mm. art in general. Like you have the siege of Syracuse. The Romans famously plundered all the art from Syracuse and they brought it back to to bedeck uh, Rome. So many instances in the second century of just Roman generals campaigning in Greece and then taking anything that they want and bringing it back to Rome. It's this like artistic merit. Um, a, a lot of those were also classical. Uh, it's not just only Hellenistic stuff, mm -hmm. but the Hellenistic period is one of the most fascinating periods in terms of art because you start seeing statues representing people outside of quote unquote, and these are big quote unquote, the norm. Mm -hmm. um, mm. You start seeing people with body types that are different, mirabile dictu. Um, you start seeing, for example, some really wonderful statues of like an old drunk woman just like crying next to her, her jar of wine and like the wrinkles are there. <laughs> her face is like, it's so different from like the core or something. Mm -hmm. uh, like, just like the, the expressionless serene face. You start seeing one of the problems um, is that there's a lot of terracotta statuettes. Uh, mm. that are labeled by museums as grotesque because they don't conform to our notions of like a healthy body or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, um, disability studies have, have got an incredible way at length to, to really break them down like and try to see like there's one where a woman has a very exposed like skeletal, uh, skeletal chest and she's also very long, it's a terracotta figurine from Asia Minor. Yeah, she's very like tall and, and lanky and it's just labeled as a grotesque, but it could be someone living with a disability that people mm -hmm. just, uh, museum curators or something back in the day, the identifiers just called this a grotesque. But, but there is a fascination in the Hellenistic period with depicting the human body in, in a lot of different shapes and sizes. And I think that's one of the the merits of it, um, especially um, and just like ah, oh, there's so it, it, there's so much um, there. You have Himbo Heracles, of course. You have depictions of the Minotaur. There, there's just yeah, Hellenistic statues are just great, and we've lost so many because mm. you, there's so many inscriptions that we're supposed to have a statue or something and then the statue gets lost or reused or gets, I don't know, melted well, down. That's yeah. the thing. I was going to say, you think about the bronze alone, like how little yeah. bronze we have versus how much we know they made of bronze is yeah. wild yeah. and sad. Yeah. And, and we think about these big statues, but there's also figurines. Like I talked about mm -hmm. with uh, Dr. Langenhooper's research on Hellenistic figurines, but we see them in, in, in uh, Ptolemaic Egypt, in, the, in Asia Minor, uh, especially also some in Syria. But you just see like local gods uh, uh, chilling alongside, you know, the Greeks. Uh, um, mm. And there's just, there, there's so much there in, 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 in so many ways. And you, yeah, it, it's just really crazy to think about someone looking at a statue of, of I don't know, that old drunk woman or something and finding I, something I there. Need to see this. Yeah, yeah, let me. See I, need to, I, I need to find it. She sounds like my future and I love it. <laughs> she She's like hanging on to wine. <laughs> like I think the statue old drunkard is what the statue's called. Oh my so God. it's not me like giving air old drunken woman. But she, yeah, she's just like looking up so yeah, if you, the Wikipedia thing for for listeners, if you just search like old drunkard Hellenistic statue or something, <laughs> that's the actual Wikipedia page is old drunkard, and of course there's two marble cups. Oh, I love her. Right. Wow. Oh. It, and it, apparently, yeah, apparently she may have ties to Dionysus as a worshiper of Dionysus uh, oh, because nice. she does have some like uh, stuff in her hair and stuff like that. So she could actually be a worshiper of Dionysus. Maybe nipped a little bit too much, uh, haven't we all? Um, yeah. Back in my my bachelor or uh, bachelor days, my uh, when I when I was doing my BA, yeah. Lord knows that was me many a night. <laughs> but yeah, like there's a, there's a, a there's a fascination with like the human form, and you see this on coins too, like Hellenistic. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people make a big deal 
of Caesar being portrayed on Roman coins realistically, you know, with that mm -hmm. turkey neck he's got dangling. Mm -hmm. But that happened, uh, that was a, a large product of the Hellenistic period. Um, mm. Starting with Alexander, you have depictions on all coins, of course, but then you have like individualized, like super, well, they're idealized portraits, of course. They're showing us what they want to show, so there's always that caveat. But mm -hmm. still, Antiochus Grippos, one of the Seleucid kings, Grippos meaning hook nose, he has a very prominent, like, hooked mm -hmm. nose, and you see that on the coin. Cleopatra's is like that too, right? Yeah. There's a lot of references of, yeah, she has like a very prominent nose yeah. in, in her coins. It's so interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You start seeing like this this shift towards like the ideal or or at least like a more vivid representation uh, that has, uh, yeah, there's so many things you can say about it. If I'm like, what do you think this, that's trying to say to the subjects? What's that trying to communicate to the subjects? Like what mm -hmm. picture of a king or a queen are you trying to do there? I also had this story lined up and there, there was no like way that I could, I was trying to see how I could, uh, uh, do a, uh, what's it called? Like a transition into this story. Mm. Um, another great thing about the Hellenistic period, you have a bunch of inscriptions. You see things like traveling doctors because of this interconnected, like the, uh, the poles of, of Greece and Asia minor and, and, and Syria are all in dialogue they're sending representatives uh uh and everything like that um you see doctors that go from city to city and they get honorific degrees so and so help this city in the time of praise so they put up this there's like the civic nature of greek cities changes somewhat they become more interconnected into this network uh, that's mm. a, a word that everyone loves to throw out network uh network theory and everything but they're right and one of my favorites is it's a dedication. Uh, let me see if I can remember her name. Oh, Aristodama of Smyrna. She gets a dedicatory inscription, an honorific inscription set up by the city of Lamia. This is in uh, Thessaly. They set up an inscription honoring her because she is actually a wandering poetess. Hmm. And she goes from city to city. She composes epic poems and she sings them. And she did such a good job of singing about the local lineage of the city, the local myth of the city, that they set up this honorific uh, dec uh, inscription for her, uh, tied up probably with a statue, and they gave her a bunch of rights. Like she had the right to be a citizen there. She could own property and it transferred to her family. So, but you see this happening, like, like that story that I told about the, the um, that Antiochus invited a poet to come to Antioch and to do a commentary on the Iliad, you start seeing more and more networks and, and the movement of peoples and guilds and stuff like that in this period, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, not to say that this did not occur before, but mm -hmm. you just start seeing it more because mm -hmm. there, there's more shifts, uh, there's more interactions, there's more accessibility. Things have opened up more in terms of, of communications and, and yeah, it's just a, yeah. a natural byproduct of just an expanded Eastern Mediterranean, especially. Um, and I'm sure just technological advancements too, just given the time period and how much had changed over like so many hundreds of years from you, say you, the you, archaic period to, to Hellenistic. Oh, this is uh, one of my... Uh, wonderful advisors, uh, Ron Bresson, uh, talks about this. He's an economic historian. He talks about, there's actually, there's there's this debate going on about how much actual technological advancement there mm. was. Um, because you see some like, yeah, one of the big things that you see, there's a lot of military innovation. I don't, uh, don't want to say technological advancement, just innovation, different things being tried out. You start seeing huge boats uh, Hellenistic navies is a thing. One of my mm. professors in undergrad, uh, William Murray, he wrote a book on just Hellenistic navies and how they push the limits on like, you have your, your bog standard triremes, yada, yada, uh, Athenian Empire, yada, yada. But then you have like, uh, one of the Ptolemies does like a, 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 a huge 40, like, rower one that like carries, I don't know how many people on it, like this super barge. It's like something right off the history channel. Um, but yeah, you start seeing like archivization, you start seeing uh, a lot more increase in like literature being discussed and written down and handed out. Um, yeah, in terms of technological innovation, that's something that 
Yeah, it's one of those tricky things because it depends mm -hmm. so much on the area and all that. It, not leaps and bounds mm. uh, from the classical period. It's more, yeah, I guess you could call it, yeah. It's just I hard to like, pinpoint. Too, but... Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, and and maybe it's just more of a matter of they just wrote more things down and I mean, hey, great. Or or like inscribed more things or what have you. Yeah, there, you there is a boon in literary culture um, um, and, and uh, facilitated. So yeah, like one of the things that I work on is like seals and stuff like mm. that in archives. And you can see it in the coins and stuff. You can see how how there's more like an increase in the artistry of the coins. Um, a lot of it also has to do with just increased awareness of uh, practices already prevalent uh, mm -hmm. in in the Near East and everything, and that being brought out. Such a good period. Uh, oh. again, again, I'm a biased source, uh, uh, I mean, but wonderful. still. Uh, uh, yeah, then you have like. Uh, Cybele uh, is like in this period. Oh, she gets yeah. she gets uh the second Punic War is when you get the the black stone quote unquote being transported uh to Rome. Uh, so they get yeah. If you even want to look at it from a Roman centric, if you want to stay on the Romans, which you're more than welcome to do uh, as someone who's interested in this period, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I say that with a slight uh, tinge of. Eh. Uh, You're not the right person. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, you have uh, these like quote unquote Eastern cults uh, being brought into Rome, and it, it, the fun thing is that they bring her in. She's a Phrygian goddess, of course, um, and they don't expect these for the Romans weirdos. These priests of hers, right, the Gali. Uh, the, uh, practice self castration. They wear makeup. They they sometimes shave their legs, uh, and they don't expect those to come along with the goddess. So it's kind of like a culture shock. But oh, this period is also one of culture shock, like the the Greeks pooping on the Roman toga and stuff <laughs> like that. Like, yeah, Rome just doesn't like uh, kick in the door into this period. Like there there's. Um, struggles there there it changes rome uh mm -hmm. just as much as it changes the composition of the, the east and so much of rome afterwards is attributed to the hellenistic kingdoms like mm -hmm. the cult of the emperor finds purchase in asia minor because they had cult, they had like they they knew hellenistic kings they they right. they're yeah appeals to myth like, and stuff like that yeah yeah they were like ready for ready for that already. yeah exactly yeah. They, they they more easily uh deified and, and mm -hmm. that is still the subject of debate of course everything is subject to debate um but the roman emperors found greater di divine purchase in in these places uh where there was already a a rich history of rulers co-opting myth and co-opting uh like their divine nature to justify their rule um mm -hmm. So yeah, there, there. It's just there's so many, so much precedent for for Roman rule in these areas that get glossed over because again, this period is like the middle child. People just want to get rush through it to get to I don't know Augustus or something, mm -hmm. Cleopatra. Again, that's mm -hmm. why like I understand why books in the Hellenistic period often use the like a little subtitle or something from Alexander to Cleopatra. But but that's always bothered me to to some extent. Um, yeah, like it's catchy, I, but yeah. then you're not you're you're more likely to yeah like ignore or gloss over the in between exactly in to get between those two. Yeah, like not every king looked back at Alexander, mm -hmm. and not everyone that looked at a coin of a Seleucid, of a Ptolemaic, of a Antigonic king and saw a youthful king with curls thought immediately Alexander. Mm -hmm. I, it's just one of those things that you have to be wary because of mm -hmm. course alexander features prominently but features prominently who uh because we mm -hmm. transplant our own value sets when we come up with these theories like oh alexander like people would have known it's like you sure about that like how many would have known maybe they just thought he was super good looking and like had really sweet curls like not everyone goes aha reference alexander mm -hmm. um yeah, it's just one of those things that you had. There, there's the it's the ghost of Alexander that is pernicious, uh, and then you have just like the the people just want to uh, 
go down to Cleopatra because she's so famous mm -hmm. and she encapsulates so much of the Hellenistic. You have a, a queen, uh, queens figure so prominently in, in the Hellenistic period. It's one of, mm. There's wonderful scholarship being done now. There's wonderful conferences on like just Hellenistic queens because, yeah, because they, they get put in positions of power because you have royal families now. And once you have royal families, of course, the queens decide, the queens bring up children. They decide on policy if the child is is not um, old enough yet to take the throne. They can kill the child if they really want to, which has happened. Um, or they can kill their husband and take over. There's so many dynamics there. And Cleopatra encompasses it, like, she knows so so and so languages, seven languages. She's a polyglot. Mm -hmm. The Hellenist period is one of intense interaction between languages, not not only Greek, but like Aramaic and Greek, uh, and, and and local Indian script on Greek or uh, Greek quote unquote Indo Greek mm -hmm. uh, coinage. Um, mm -hmm. There's just uh, so much there for for, and I I see the allure. I just I just mm -hmm. wish people would stop. <laughs> <laughs> or at least give them a break. Like yeah. they've earned, they've earned a rest. Right. Talk about another Cleopatra. Cleopatra yeah. Thea, my boo. She's wonderful. She like lead. Like, she does so much stuff. She's always in the wings working on stuff. Greco-Roman authors hate her. Uh, I sound like an ad for like, one of these pop-up ads. <laughs> <laughs> The queen but, nobody wants you to know about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah. They, it, but yeah, and and they conform so much again to the, this like notion of like sexuality in, in the East and this like mm -hmm. inverse of of the male dominated uh, structure of the Greeks and the Romans back home. Um, mm -hmm. Men become women, women become men. Uh, that is a thing that Greco Roman authors like latch on to. Yeah, if you stay in the East too long, you become Antony, uh, for example, as the right. Western propaganda would have you believe. Uh, you become luxurious and, and soft and effeminate. You put on makeup. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. Oh, it's also interesting. But this was incredible. <laughs> this was such an <laughs> incredible conversation. It yeah. is very rare that I talk to anyone this long. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, of course. I had a, a ball. Again, it. Rare that I get to to wax poetic about this if it's on like a conference or something. Uh, so yeah, no, it's a thrill. It's my this is my favorite part of the job is when I just get to get academics talking. <laughs> Editing it afterwards is my last favorite part. But no, I yeah, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> I know. God, I can't even imagine. <laughs> well, this is gonna be two episodes, which is great. I'll, <laughs> I'll take it. Perfect. Uh, uh, is there anything that you want to share with my audience or promote or anywhere you want them to follow you? Anything at all? No, I mean, no, I don't I have a blog, but like, I don't update it that much. Uh, <laughs> I like shit post on Twitter. <laughs> there's a lot of otter yeah, yeah, there's a lot of otter content. Uh, uh, some thirst tweets from now and then ancient thirst tweets, uh, some like lewd martial poetry that I do from time to time. But like, yeah, no, I'm just a, a graduate student in his fourth year who like really likes to talk about this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I don't have like a mixtape or anything. Um, yeah, I just like talk about this stuff. So, yeah. I mean, I'll take it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I really yeah, appreciate course. it. No, of course. Um, I had a delightful time. Ugh, once again, thank you all so much for listening. This part of my job, man, it's the fucking coolest. Also, I'm recording and editing so many things so far advance, in advance right now that I'm, I'm kind of lost in all the episodes and conversations. Just no idea what things I'm saying repeatedly, like back to back. So when you hear this, I'll be in Greece, writing my novel and only vaguely working on the podcast. So make sure you're following me on Instagram for pictures of me in new and exciting places. I'll share some facts maybe when I remember. Ideally, I'll do an Instagram live or two. Again, when I remember because I'm shit at remembering. But pictures? Ugh. I remember to take and post pictures. That's for sure. I might even record an episode over there. We will see. 
In any case, that's all to say, here's another instance of me waxing about how much I appreciate you all for listening and helping this to be my job, for loving conversation episodes and wanting to listen to me listen to scholars tell me everything that lives inside their brains. It's so, so much fun and I am so, 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 so grateful that this is my job and life, like what the actual fuck, you know? Anyway, this was such an incredibly fun conversation to have. I mean, so fun, it's two episodes. That's a real feat. It was also interesting and insightful. Like, I learned so much about the bits and pieces of the Hellenistic period. I simply, I couldn't bring myself to cut out, like, a half an hour of it. Hell no. Two episodes it is. Now, as much as he didn't ask you to, I would highly recommend you follow Eduardo on Twitter. Not least because he's incredibly funny and shares lots of otter photos. There's a link in the episode's description. Let's Talk About Myths, baby, is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians. She handles so many things, just like everything, you know? Especially while I'm away, she's a true lifesaver. Absolutely love Michaela. Our intern is Grace Roby. She's helping out with loads of things as well. But again, when I'm recording this, she hasn't started, so I can't be specific, but I know she's going to be great. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. Nerd stuff. Am I right? Who doesn't love learning for free? Isn't that what makes podcasts just the fucking coolest things? Thank you all so much for listening, learning along with me. I am Liv and I love this shit. Mm-hmm.